it's like a defense mechanism that when you encounter an overwhelming situation, the human being is designed to take the overwhelming emotions and hide them somewhere in the body. Awareness, the final frontier. This is Awareness Explorers. Welcome back, fellow explorers to Awareness Explorers. I'm your co-host, Jonathan Robinson, and I'm with my friend and trusty co-host. Brian Tom O'Connor. And we have a guest today, Walter Dennison, that Brian will introduce because between us, we know Walter really well. Uh, I know him 0% and Brian knows him well. So together we have 100% knowing of Walter. And uh, but I have heard some interesting things in the last few minutes. So I look forward to hearing about Walter and some methods he's created. But Brian, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Walter Dennison? Okay, so Walter and I know each other because Walter is the host of the weekly Rupert Spira meetup on Zoom, which started in Walter's apartment with his wife, Patricia, in New York City, and I used to attend. And then during COVID, it sort of went on hiatus for a while. And I said to Walter, hey, listen, I have a I have a pro Zoom account. You want me to help you start up the meetup again? And, and we did. So now I'm sort of the co-host, although Walter definitely founded it. And over the years, Walter has shared a lot of techniques that he's used in cases of extreme distress and anxiety. And I found them really interesting. And I thought that they would be useful for our listeners to hear. So that's why we invited Walter to be on the podcast. So welcome, Walter. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Jonathan. Very glad to be here. So Walter, for people who don't know of your background, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into Rupert and creating all these ways to hopefully feel better and get out of anxiety? Certainly. So it's kind of interesting that, uh, again, I've been almost, you can almost say a lifelong, you know, on the, on the path of uh, exploration and self-exploration that wandered into uh, transcendental meditation in high school and kind of continued that and off and on, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. And wandered into a few other practices, you know, kind of generally related to exploring the metaphysical and, and the non-tangible uh, realms. And my uh, stepson was working here in the Hudson Valley on a, a friend's uh, house and uh, came across, he was going for an errand in one of the Bob's car and inside of it was a book uh, written by Jean Klein. And he thumbed through it and uh, was, uh, was interested. From that, he found out that uh, one of the students of John Klein, uh, Francis Lucille, was actually here in the United States and still practicing and started looking him up. And uh, my wife and I actually started uh, Francis Lucille meetup group before the Rupert group uh, back in the late uh, aughts. And that kind of got us started with that. And then uh, on one of Francis's retreats, we actually met Rupert when he was still a student of Francis's. Mm. And uh, then that was, and he at that time was just starting to go out and uh, teach on his own. And we kind of followed from there. And Patricia and a friend, Jacques, went on one of uh, Rupert's early retreats and were very enthusiastic about it and said, oh, remember that meetup that we were having, Francis? Why don't we re re restart that but, and focus it on Rupert's teachings? And uh, so in 2012, we got that started and it's been going ever since. That's a lot of years. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 it was kind of interesting to see how long that's been going on, but uh, mm -hmm. it's been wonderful. It's great. Yeah, I think it's wonderful too, and I'm so happy that you're doing it. I wanted to backtrack a little bit because you um, sort of traced the steps from Jean Klein through Francis Lucille to Rupert. Can you tell us a little bit about Jean Klein? He's, he's, uh, it was, he was French. He's no longer living, I believe. Correct. And, um, that's correct. Yep. I believe he was a student of Atmananda Krishna Menon, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and and yes, and that was his Indian uh, input. And uh, you know, he I think from my understanding, again, I don't know all the the details, but uh, he was the one that first kind of put the Vedanta study together with the Kashmiri Shaivism tantric study, 
into kind of the, the basic practice that uh, Francis and Rupert have continued to teach. And that's, again, both the kind of the traditional, what Rupert will call the inward path, where you identify that there is something aware of all your experiences and kind of step back from the world of objects and engaging with them uh, to identify and try and become aware of that that something or other that's that's aware of all that and that he calls the inward path and so you finally come that there is something aware that is seems to be different from this thing that is not this thing here and it is has is much more permanent and much more broad in scope but then using the kashmiri shaivism and the and the tantric approach uh, to come back and reintegrate that understanding to understand that that which i essentially am is that which all the objects that i perceive and all the other beings that i perceive are essentially are and created from and thus to kind of get back to a holistic approach that says what I am is what everything is, and to kind of experience that whole unity, and uh, and also the the idea of coming back to to being, and not just to stay with the understanding of I'm aware of being aware, or uh, I'm aware of my thoughts and trying to to manage your thoughts and stuff, but to come back to something where you genuinely get back to some more bringing peace and integrating into your whole life. So you don't just transcend into the world mm -hmm. of uh, of awareness and become sort of above the world, but once you realize that, you go back into the world and and see that everything is that awareness. Exactly, exactly. And and for me, that uh, you know is 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 very important uh, and has been really been helpful for me in terms of really feeling established in in my true being and to understand much more the, the nuances of what it's like to live with that understanding. Mm -hmm. I have heard that you have sometimes had a rough go of it, and that helped you to come up with creative ways to get out of the suffering. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, again, that 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 was kind of the general question that, that Brian shared with me a little earlier. But as I kind of thought of it and looked back across my my path and so forth, it seems to be have a lot more continuity to it in terms of there was something that kind of was always drawing me into a deeper understanding. And it started off more superficial in terms of kind of noting that there, se there seems to be something beyond just the tangible things that I can touch, see, feel, and, and you know, directly experience. And that may have been why I got into transcendental meditation so long ago was just that, that kind of deep intuition. And definitely as crises came up, as they come up in all our lives, uh, that continued to help motivate me to, to look more broadly and more deeply uh, through, the, through the years. And it's also kind of a consistent thing that as the need arose, uh, new, new techniques and new practices and new new teachings would come into my experience and uh, so for instance at one point you know looking at people who were channeling uh things and yeah that was interesting to try again try and understand something that's beyond what what doesn't seem like a logical sort of thing in the materialist kind of world and then into to, to chakras and understanding those and trying to experience those and uh again you know, just, you know, seeing that those kind of led me to a deeper understanding. And then trying to reconcile the fact and I kind of come to an, an understanding that I wasn't really happy, even though material things were there and things were going pretty well that way. There were times when I felt a deep, uh, deep dissatisfaction or, or became more aware of my suffering. And again, started looking more broadly and more deeply and stuff. And then, you know, major life crises like the divorce and stuff like that pushed it even along even further. And then when I met uh, my second wife, Patricia, she helped me introduce me to some more structured studies. And that was the New York School of Practical Philosophy, which was a very Vedanta oriented, uh, but other teachings as well. And that tended that for a while. And again, that was helpful to get some more specific stuff. And again, I think what Brian in particular was referring to was um, in the last five to seven years, again, it's been actually a lifelong habit of, of waking up in the middle of the night 
and that's just I, I contributed more actually to biology than anything else and uh, in fact I've heard that in the middle ages people regularly would get up in the middle of the night chat with each other for a couple hours and then go back to sleep and mm -hmm. get up again and so I think I'm very much of that biology and uh, so but you know especially as work was there you know you'd want to be rested for the next day so instead of turning on the television or reading a book or chatting with a neighbor, I would just sit and relax and try and, you know, hopefully get relaxed again to go back to sleep. But during that period of time uh, is when uh, I started, and that's also, again, and not coincidentally, uh, it's all part of a whole, that I started getting from Rupert's teachings, the idea of the body. And that's one of the great things that also Jean Klein uh, brought about was the fact that the misunderstanding that this is a separate being is not just a mental uh, misunderstanding, but that misunderstanding is also incorporated into the body. And uh, Francis and Rupert have gone as far to say that it's 10% intellectual understanding and 90% physical. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's, that was an interesting thing to understand that that kind of partly explains why when you leave a retreat or you leave a uh, inspirational video or an inspirational book, you feel sucked right back into the day to day. I'm an, I'm an object, I'm dealing with objects, I'm going to die, I'm worried about things. And so this nighttime exploration kind of broadened and started exploring the body more or kind of it actually kind of just came to me. And uh, so what I would do is during that period of time, and again, this was very regularly, many times a week for, for years on end, uh, and as I tried to do the relaxation, I would come across contractions, energy, things. And after a while, uh, and Rupert also you know, taught to try and engage these things, uh, to bring them towards your attention rather than pushing them away as, you know, again, they're, they're oftentimes unpleasant feelings or they're linked to unpleasant stories in your mind and stuff. So the idea of welcoming them and bringing them mm -hmm. closer to, to my attention merged with my actual nighttime experience and so when i would come across uh, some energy and so forth i would bring it to my attention and kind of in my mind I, I like rupert's term feeling imagination i would kind of use my feeling imagination to to, to imagine going to the center of that energy mm -hmm. and in doing that i started experiencing all sorts of intense emotions sometimes anger sometimes sadness sometimes shame sometimes sorrow some you know all different uh, emotions that we have and again looking around the room i could see that there wasn't any direct cause from that and you know in my recent couple of days there was nothing to account for it so the idea that these had somehow been sequestered in the body over the years and the mm -hmm. notion that i use and yeah i've heard other people kind of talk about it that it's almost like a defense mechanism that when you encounter an overwhelming situation, the, the human being is kind of designed to take the overwhelming emotions and hide them somewhere in the body so that you can deal with survival in the moment or getting on with things. Well, you know, I'm a, a former psychotherapist. I haven't renewed my license for a while, but in trauma work, and I do work with MDMA and trauma work a lot. They have you do this type of thing where you're focusing on a constriction and getting to the center of it and often then will take you back to an earlier time when you were traumatized and i think what's going on is that your body is trying to properly digest an experience that was not digested at that time yes and it's interesting because recently i went through a a pretty intense crisis with a career thing and was having probably the hardest time I've had in maybe 20 years uh, for about a month. And I would do this practice and get into the body and, and get into the constriction. And then things from when I was four and five years old would show up and I would kind of uh, get to experience that again, and hopefully to complete it in a way and externally the things change so I'm feeling better now but internally doing that practice seemed to lessen the constriction and and help me to once again get back to more of a peaceful place so it sounds like you've been through this uh, whole experience quite a bit yes yes and very similar to that and again hearing this from different people 
that's why I kind of, again, it's just my own model. I like to build models from my experience to help me understand it better. It's not essential to, to, to the treatment of it, but that this may be a common human biological or psychological kind of thing. But it's mm -hmm. not just psychological because for me, it's an experience in, in the body, not just in the mind. Yeah. And, you know, it kind of in, at Rupert's uh, suggestion from his teachings and stuff to try and not uh, necessarily require uh, a, a, a story to go along with it. Mm -hmm. to just be able to stick with the raw emotion so just sitting there in the middle of the night to just be angry and you know then gnashing your teeth and clenching your hands and just and just experiencing this intense anger or this intense sadness and tears falling and stuff like that but to not necessarily have to engage with the story and just wherever it was however it came from that the kind of this feeling exploration would unearth it it would 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 discover it and I would sense it and bring it to the attention and stuff. So that, for me, kind of made it a little bit simpler in terms of not trying to have to associate it with something, just experience. And for me, that brought great benefit over time, again, slowly, little bit yeah. by little bit, to find relief. The key is to get into the sensation and the emotion rather than the story. Every time I got lost in the story, I felt like I was just looping endlessly. It didn't seem like anything was happening other than just going over a story and and yes. that was very helpful yeah yes that that was my experience as well and again you know for me just sticking with the raw feeling and so forth was was, was more helpful mm -hmm. yeah and i love your description of it when you had when you were young and you had a feeling that you couldn't handle you hid it away and you hid it away in the body and it remained hidden there i think that's such a a, a great model but i was under the impression mistakenly that these emotions were what woke you up in the middle of the night but it was your biology you said you woke, woke you up in the middle of the night and you did the practice of relaxing turning your attention to the sensations in the body looking for constrictions or tightnesses and seeing if you can let them go and that they kind of opened up connection to hidden emotions that then would rise to the surface and that's pretty brave so i was wondering if you could um for anyone who might be scared to do to, to do that you know give some tips that might might help certainly no glad to uh and, and I, I and i i try and uh support people that that you know we engage with in our group but in other places to be brave and and to try and face it because again we're not taught anywhere how to deal with with again in general especially as males we're taught to be essentially disassociate ourselves from any kind of feeling and to just tough it out and to use your mental things and whatever to uh to get through things so to to, to deal with feelings and to bring them uh is is kind of counterintuitive in our culture uh, in the way our culture is set up and the way where things are reinforced uh so uh you know that kind of along at the same time, uh, you know, that there would be times when I would get, uh, you know, not, a, not as extreme numbers, but I had a number of panic attacks and so forth. And that was just when I was reading uh, Eckhart Tolle and understanding uh, his, you know, I just love his description of the pain body. And I came to recognize that in my experience as well. And to go through the panic attack and kind of link that to the idea of the pain body and just understand that that which the, pain, the panic attack thinks is going to die is actually the pain body and not this. And to, to kind of have that to go through a panic attack and just be brave enough to face it, to go through the experience of feeling like you're gonna die, but then you don't. And, and then to take that same experience into the, to this nighttime exploration of sometimes these very intense feelings to kind of say, oh, well, if that didn't kill me, maybe this won't either. And to just throw myself into it and, you know, just Again, sometimes these things are very intense because they were, you know, again, thinking over our lives, we can think of intense experiences where there was extreme shame or anger or fear and things like that to jump into that. And so what I would do as part of that is I'd like to phrase, and I don't remember who I heard it from, but just to say, you know, kind of to some thing, and I, and I call it consciousness, where I would say, you can have this back or to my true self. I don't need this energy anymore. It's done its purpose. It's come full circle. 
and you can have it back. So the idea that this body didn't have, or this mind didn't have to deal with it single-handedly, especially if it's overwhelming, to kind of give it back to something larger than this that would be more capable of digesting it than this. So it kind of just imagining it kind of going out of its bubble or its bottle or its container and just handing it back. And so I kind of pictured it almost radiating from myself so that I didn't have to hold on to it. Or I wasn't tempted to hold on to it. And so it could be almost as intense as it wanted to and rather, and just to let it be that intense. And again, between the experience with the panic attacks and this kind of handing off, be able to handle this very intense or be able to go forward into this intense emotion all the way until it dissipated. That, that's a, a brilliant technique. I plan to use that. I wish you had, I had interviewed you a month ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what helped me was um, a, a slightly different technique. I would say, uh, can I relax with this and just be with it for the next 20 seconds? Yes. Because if I could do that, then it would change or it would, you know, then I could do that again 20 seconds later if necessary. But having a time limit on it uh, really helped me to be with it. You know, people will go into like a very crowded elevator and walk into it because they know it'll only be for a minute. Right. You know, you, if, if you knew you were going to do that for four <laughs> hours, you would never walk in, you know? So it yeah. really helps me to have that sense of this is very temporary. I, I'm okay to relax with it. But I like the idea of, uh, okay, I got this. I'm fully experiencing it. Now uh, it can, uh, I can offer it back to consciousness, to the universe, to God, whatever right. might be your metaphor. Uh, that's yeah, a really exactly. Sweet what, whatever means something to you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I, I found that is, especially for the very intense energies that, are, again, there's some that are, are, are more mild. And again, you know, some are anger, some are, are fear, some are sadness. So, you know, the, mm -hmm. the emotions also play into that. But, uh, you know, that one of the other things that, especially for people who have studied more non-duality things, that one of the things that I found to be true is to, to not try and specifically go into this exercise with the purpose of getting rid of something, that mm -hmm. that becomes also counterproductive, that it kind of reduces the, the ability to let go of it because it's, it's a very egoic kind of separate self sort of thing to say, this is something that's bothering me. What can I, what pill can I take? What app can I look at? What can I do to, to get rid of this? And so while my experience is that these things do, that this process does dissipate these emotions and does transform me to go into that with, and then Rupert has a nice test that he said is, can I live with this feeling for the rest of my life? And mm -hmm. part of that's a deeper understanding that it's part of a larger picture. It, it's not this, I'm not that feeling. It's something that's made out of consciousness that, that that's bigger than just this and is part of a larger picture. And so with that kind of confidence, I can say, yes, I could live with this for the rest of my days because that which is aware of that is not affected by it. And that's what I truly am. So it, it, it helps to do that as, as kind of a practice to say, I'm going through this because it's needed right now. This, this emotion has presented itself for me in my trying to relax in the middle of the night, I would just kind of wander across these things as I kind of would try and relax. So this is something that's come to me. This is something that needs to be experienced. And it's something that's been offered to me as opposed to something that the ego or separate self is seeking for a purpose. It's just, no, this is just something that's happening and needs to happen. And yes, I experience it and maybe intensely, but then I can let it go as it dissipates. Yeah, I really like that description. And earlier you said you were you are drawing it into yourself, which mm -hmm. is a completely different paradigm from, from pushing it away. And uh, I, I once uh, was having trouble with, with the uh, thought uh, of, um, can I live with this forever when there was a difficult emotion? And I said, well, you know, maybe I bet you I could even simplify it even further. And I came up with this, inhale the emotion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just just inhale. Don't act not and not exhale the emotion because that means you're trying to get rid of it. Just, <laughs> just inhale it. Just bring it closer and and allow it to be. But there's also something that you also alluded to, because it sounds like it's not really the Walter character 
that's okay with the emotion. It's the identification with that larger awareness, which is already here, which is already okay with everything that appears. Would, is that accurate? Absolutely, yes. And, and, and you know, in, 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 in the limited understanding that I have of whatever that is, to understand that, that it can handle that and is not going to be damaged by that to have the courage to go through that experience. And again, once it, you've gone through it a couple of times, you say, yes, this this works and this is gonna survive. You know, if it's gonna disappear, it's gonna disappear for other reasons, not by experiencing this intense emotion. And so you have, I get more confidence about it. And kind of like you're inhaling, what I would imagine is I, I would, again, using my feeling imagination would sense this energy uh, and to kind of, arbitrarily just imagine a center of it and to just kind of bring my attention to the very center theoretically the most intense part of it and just say okay let, let me go to that center part of it and that would be but that's very much just like what you were talking about yeah and that's also very similar to one of the um in the sedona method they had three original methods but they had several different forms of releasing that they developed over time and one was dive into the center of the feeling just as yeah. you described and that may be where i got that that imagery from was uh, from reading that yeah yeah or um, else sometimes uh, these things occur in many different places at the right. same time they're yes. in the air yes my wife is a psychotherapist and she does something called EMDR, which is a trauma release method that's very effective. And one of their methods is to dive into the center of the most uncomfortable aspect of the feeling. And that's where you get the juice. One of the things I sometimes do is I say, um, I ask myself, can I let go to, can I let go of resisting this completely? And can I let go of resisting it even more? That's kind of a Sedona method as well. No, that's that's and, beautiful, Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah. It really helps because it's our resistance that causes most of the suffering. Absolutely. And, and when you get better at letting go of resistance in an intense emotion, then you let go of letting uh, uh, of resistance to things being as they are in your life as well. It's a really yes. good practice. Yes. And again, for me, my experience too, was that a lot of the resistance was related to the stories. So by trying to, to, you know, understand that relationship and again, as, as Brian was saying, to be courageous, to, to go through that experience was to try and exactly address the resistance. So that mm -hmm. I, again, and, and I like what Brian has, has shared in our group, you know, what, what can I do about my current experience that doesn't use any words? And to mm -hmm. just really do things to bring you back to just the physical sensation. So for me, it was just using that feeling imagination to just feel that energy just by itself, whatever energy it was, and then to use that to guide guide me, so to speak, to it and to, to engage with it. And uh, But again, to stay away from the resistance. Yeah. And, you know, that let it go in of letting go of resistance can be almost like a mantra throughout your day because yes. it, there's always a little, uh, Audra Shanti said this in one of the retreats I went to with him. He said, there's always some resistance you're doing unless you're fully enlightened in that moment. So, you know, somebody will be talking to me and I'll, there's a little bit of resistance like, gee, I wish they'd get over with that sentence or I wish they would say this instead of that. You know, just little stuff. Or I wish that, you know, that sound in the background wasn't there. And and just being aware, can I let go of that resistance is a way to be more fully here and uh, and present and and not the, the suffering that we normally have that's pushing against reality. Oh yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying, and I and I have I've used it to, to many in many situations, exactly as you described. These especially these annoying things that uh, that that we encounter in our experience, and you know, and, and over time doing that practice, I think as you're kind of hinting at, is helps you bring it into more and more parts of your life, and mm -hmm. especially in dealing with again with 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 colleagues at work and with people that you encounter and people at parties and stuff to be open that way to kind of regardless of instead of saying oh i'm going to pigeonhole this person and they're that kind of person which kind of to me is an instant setting up of resistance 
yeah. uh, is intend to to approach them with an open heart and an open mind and just listen to them and you know and talk to them and, and you know what I try and do is use that to find a common area of experience or something or just to listen to their experience and and see what they have to say uh, has been very helpful and again again not to resist that that they must be this kind of thing or what they're going to say is something I'm going to hate or what they are say is something I disagree with strongly but just mm -hmm. be there with that in that moment and to kind of recognize that they can have that understanding and have whatever belief they have and it doesn't necessarily need to affect me in that moment you know yeah yeah um, um a phrase i use that helps me tune into that is uh they are being a perfect them yes yes and that's yeah. and that's and, and you know that from again my deeper understanding i see that they don't have a choice in that they're not choosing to do that mm -hmm. uh that it, that's their path and they've got their conditioning and circumstances have guided them to that moment very much as I've been guided to to this moment and to the moments that we're talking about and to not blame anybody for it to just say this is this is what's happening this is the way it is and this is the way it's supposed to be mm -hmm. but again having that deeper connection makes me less fearful of engaging with it you know now mm -hmm. you said that this practice you've done um over over years and so i'm curious as to that i i assume that there's an immediate effect and a long-term effect and that maybe they're different i was wondering if you could shed a little and, light on that yes definitely and again you know for the most part as intense as some of these things were i didn't necessarily find a lot of short-term benefit and that was also part of the not trying to get rid of it kind of thing saying no i'm going through this experience and just see where it is but i definitely noticed over time kind of a transformation happening in my experience and that and that was something that i had not heard of anywhere else or anything but a, what i call a great clarity that over those years that things just started getting clearer and clearer to me both in terms of engaging with challenges that come into my experience but also in very you know kind of coming to a, a personal understanding of things that i'd heard francis say or rupert say or jean klein say that i'd heard them say and it was intellectually okay I, I hear what they're saying but to come to a direct experience of that that there was just that clarity where all of a sudden one day i would say oh that's what they were talking about that's what rupert was saying i got it i i I, I get it now. I'm experiencing that. And so that that and uh, in the School of Practical Philosophy, they they had this idea of she's that kind of uh, would take your understanding and, and kind of obscure the, your understanding and experience of the world. And very much taking that idea that through this practice, the she's were gradually being removed. And so there were fewer and fewer of them so that the, the things that I experienced were clearer and clearer. And, the other analogy that I use that's more simplistic is you have this very dirty window and, you know, you keep washing it and wiping it and wiping it and only gradually does the grime go away. But sure enough, after a while, you can see something through the window that you never saw before. And as you keep wiping, you see it more clearly and more clearly. So that's that's how, how I kind of felt the experience was. But it was throughout pretty much all aspects of my experience. You know, that's so funny that you say that. I have an experience just a, after a shower. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, the mirror will be steamed up. Yep. And I'll yep. take a little towel and I'll wipe it. But it doesn't get clear right away. I wipe and wipe and, and I still can't see the image clearly. And I wipe and I wipe. But for some reason, it gets clear all of a sudden. Wipe, 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 wipe. Not clear, not clear. And then wipe. Bang. <laughs> crystal yeah. clear and yeah. and i always and i thought you know that's sort of the the way it is you 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 know you keep you keep looking inside you keep allowing your experience to be as it is you keep noticing what's happening in the body wordlessly and eventually the happiness that's really our default nature reveals itself and as you say the sheaths fall away yeah and that's, you know, as you've heard me to say to some of the people in our group to try and give them the, the, the patience and uh, wherewithal to, to, to go through this, what is often for most people a gradual process, is to share that with them 
to say that every experience, spiritual experience you you encounter, any time you touch the truth, you 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 go through a path that brings you to your deeper truth. Every one of those is transformational, sometimes in a very subtle way, but you know, just showing up to a group, just listening to your podcast here, anything you do that does that is transformational and just to keep doing whatever is coming into your experience whether it's reading a book watching youtube videos uh following a teacher whatever it is that helps lead you back to something that you feel is that you're true the truth or revealing the truth to you or remembering the truth however you want to look at it that they're all transformational but to have the patience to let it work so exactly as you say that you keep wiping the mirror and that one day things will you you will you, it's it's that sort of thing you know when you're on the other side because all of a sudden you see something you didn't see before but you'd never you don't know when it is you cross the line mm -hmm. yeah. i'm wondering walter if uh you've had any experience using various drugs to help in this process i say it because i i work with some people using low dose ketamine or mdma that helps them to know what it's like to have intense experiences, feelings without the resistance. I personally have found that helpful as well. I'm wondering if you've done that at all. Yeah, not yet, but I am very curious about that. And, uh, you know, that, that uh, I, and I'm contemplating, uh, you know, engaging with, with something like MDMA. Uh, and I'm very curious to see what my experience of that would be uh and uh so i'll let you know maybe we can do that for a future podcast is when when i when i've crossed that uh that that particular experience to to share our our, our experiences on that but uh, i'm very curious and my feeling right now is that many of my, the, the experiences that i'm relating and that we're going to will be have an overlap with that but again until i have that experience i don't know mm -hmm. yeah uh it's 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 really beautiful to watch that birth when people have been resisting something their whole life. And then, wow, I don't need to resist this. I'm safe. And yeah. to have that experience for the first time is really oh. beautiful to watch. Oh, yeah. And, and for some people, it could be different things. It could be that they feel that in a relationship or in nature that they are just more open uh, but, you know, ketamine or MDMA can certainly sometimes be helpful in that way as well. Yeah. And, you know, part of the, another reason I'm curious for that is for people, we've had some people who come to our group who've had uh, some of these, uh, these psychoactive drugs and they have an experience, but they don't have any model or any language to uh, kind of engage with it. And sometimes yeah. they're just totally freaked out about it. It's like mm -hmm. I had, and sometimes they're also spontaneous life experiences. I had this feeling of unity. Well, what the hell is it? Am I going crazy and so forth? So for me, you know, what I try and do in those situations is try and share with them the language that that my teachers have have passed on to me to help yeah. give them a context that no, you're not crazy. Everybody you see on this meeting today has had experiences like that. You're not you're not crazy, you, you're not alone, and to try and give them models and analogies and so forth to help them digest that experience so that they can engage with it. And, you know, because I've heard, and I've also seen people who've done hundreds and hundreds of trips, and I kind of, why would you do hundreds and hundreds of right, trips? Right. If really, only one or two are necessary. But the idea that, that their resistance is so deep that what's being revealed, they're, they're just not engaging with it. And to try and so help people to take that and be able to actually integrate it into their life in, in a healing kind of way. Yeah, that's what's so important and, and often missing in that type of psychedelic type work. And, and that's why I, I feel, again, it's so important to have, you know, for me, it, it, I feel like my teaching is it would be a guide, but to have somebody help you through these experiences mm -hmm. to give, be able to at least give you some sort of assurance or, or support as you go through integrating this this radically different understanding that you can come away with and because it's just so again you know brian and i i'm sure you have too in your exploration when you come to a, a deeper understanding of what i feel is the reality of nature it's just so radically different from the culture at large and yeah. what you what we're taught and conditioned to that it can it's just can be so huge that it can be jarring you know Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and also you get no support in most people's life there, there's nobody they can talk to 
that's not going to say they're crazy and that they should go see a psychotherapist. And uh, well, luckily, there's this good podcast called Awareness Explorers that can support people along those lines. Exactly, exactly. And that's so, it, don't underestimate the importance of that at all. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, uh, and again, even for people in, in our regular group, they, uh, they have become big fans of, of the work that you've done in terms of helping to, to share other, other people's who you brought onto the show, their experience, which they found very helpful where they are right now. Yeah, sometimes yeah. I forget, you know, I live in California and all my friends are into this. And then every right. now and then I meet someone and they go, well, I had this experience where I felt one with nature. I don't know what to make of that. It's like, exactly. Like, really? Yeah. And I go, you see, how, you see how bothered they are. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. But again, you know, I, 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 I count that as one of my chief blessings is to have people around me such as yourselves mm -hmm. and stuff that, that I can share this with. And, uh, you know, and to, cause I, and to, to be respectful of, of the isolation that people find in general in, in much broader thing than that they just, there's nobody they can talk to. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and also the value of this is that, different things work for different people or in different ways. It's great to hear what one person has gone through. But one of the things I've always admired about you, Walter, is that you're really supportive when someone puts it in a different way or has a different model of it or a different technique, um, uh, not trying to steer them into your way, but just to listen and allow and give them good, positive feedback. Yes. Now, and you know, I what what my experience of that has been is that clarity that I, we were talking about just a few minutes ago. That when when they are talking, to have kind of an intuition that helps me understand the definitions they're using, or you know, what what their personal experience is. And I can't explain. This is one of those things that again, a materialist model can't possibly explain how I could know this. But to be able, when I'm talking to these people, to have this intuitive understanding so that I can exactly support them there. And so often I find, almost in every case, I find that we're talking about the same thing. And to be able to get past the, the syntax or the nomenclature or the definitions, to be able to say, no, we're talking about the same thing. You're on the right path and do do the support that you're, you're exactly talking. And the best that I can to do it in the words that they're uh, using. So that, that they understand that that uh, you know uh, that when I I can support them in something that they can readily uh, take in and say okay that I, I'm on the right track you know yeah yeah but, but thank you for that is there any uh, stuff that you want to mention that we haven't asked you about or that would be useful to convey I'm sure there are many things but I can't think of anything at the moment. <laughs> But this has been just a wonderful discussion. I've just yeah. enjoyed it so much. I thought so too, yeah. Well, maybe it's time for the meditation. Yes, if, if you've got no other questions or anything, yes, I'd be glad to give that a try. Let's, Let's do it. Sounds good. Yeah. Let's jump in. All right. So uh, again, then I'm going to ask the people listening to this to use their feeling imagination. So Generally, close your eyes to kind of uh, reduce the stimulation going to your brain and just follow the intent of what I'm saying and not necessarily the words. And so if the words I'm using uh, jar with you and stuff, try and just let the words go and go back to what I'm trying to share with you with those words. So let's start right now with some deep breaths. Breathe in. Breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Just kind of settle ourselves. And now remind yourself or recall yourself to the present moment. Try and let go of anything that might be in the future, anything that might be in the past and just come to this present moment where you're listening to my voice, you're feeling yourself in your chair, you're being in the room that you're in, and just being right here and right now. And if your mind goes off, that's fine. But if it, when it occurs to you that it has to come back again to this present moment. 
Now, in this relaxed moment, try and scan, use your attention, I'll say in your head, but it can be anything in your experience right now. And just kind of use the attention to kind of look around, kind of like a radar, and look around in your experience now. And if you have any sense that there is a separate self, one that's temporary, one that's going to pass from the earth someday, one that came into the earth at some point in time, and that if there's any separation from the oneness that I believe we all are and I experience that we all are, try and find that boundary. Try and see if there's there should be a boundary. If there's separate things, there should be a boundary somewhere. So scan your experience and look for that boundary. And look first close in. Just scan gently around. And then go out a little bit farther and scan and, and spread out the attention just a little bit more broadly. And then a little bit broader still and see if you found any boundaries, anything that your feeling imagination can say, oh, there's this side and there's that side. And try and stay away from the thinking about it or who's thinking about it and just go to this direct attention sweeping through your experience. We'll go out a little bit farther, take a bigger step, and still keep scanning and see if you find anything to be separate. And if you do, then just pay attention to that and bring it to your attention. And you can let what other things that I say go while you pay attention to it and just bring it to your attention and study it. Or just take note of it and maybe come back and study it another time. Then finally, let your attention go as broadly as you feel it can and see if it runs into anything. So we'll just stay with that way for a few breaths. And this can be in all directions. Go out as broadly as you can. Now, you want to bring your attention back to your more immediate physical presence here. And use that same feeling imagination now to turn it more directly to your body. And any part of your body is fine. Be your head, your neck, your shoulder, your torso, your legs, your arms. And as you go through, use that same attention you used before to explore it. And go in different directions. And I'm not necessarily talking just about physical directions, they can be other kinds of directions, deeper different parts, different layers, and see if you run into any contractions, any aches or pains that are not due to some sort of injury or something, but are just aches or pains that are in your, your body. And if you find something, and it can be a resistance, it can be a thought, it can be Something that, oh, I don't like this guided meditation. That's, that's good, too. And follow that. See if there's something to that. See if there's an energy behind that. And try and use your feeling imagination to go to that energy, to, to kind of hold it in your attention. Almost, again, not with your eyes, but with your feeling imagination. Look at that energy. And be aware of it. And if you're ready or if it feels appropriate, try and go and touch it a bit. See if you don't get some energy from it. And if there's, it's like tasting a dish on a dinner. See if you get a taste for it. Is it anger, is it sadness, shame, sorrow? Again, we don't have to go into it more deeply, but if you found something, then consider using that same feeling imagination, that same kind of exploration in your own time, in your own place, to explore that. And if it feels right, as we've talked about in today's episode, explore it and bring it to your attention. Don't push it away and explore it. And 
again, you don't, there's nothing that says you have to dive in right now. You can dive in whenever you're ready. But if you ever feel ready, start feeling like you're going into this energy. And again, as I kind of described, kind of identify, see if there's a center and see if you can move yourself into that center. And again, you can go back in. And again, if it gets too intense, go back out and leave, leave it there. You know, it's not going anywhere, unfortunately. But I found from my experience that if you do engage it and you do experience that energy, whatever kind of energy it is, and again, to let it radiate out from you, don't hold on to it. You don't need it anymore. That this energy does dissipate if you spend enough time with it. And again, it sometimes can take a long time. Anyway, now come back, come back to our breath. Feel the air going in. Release it, feel the air going out. Feel the chair that you're sitting on or the floor you're standing on. Now come back, come back to your current presence and come back to this wonderful podcast. When you're ready, open your eyes and be back in your current experience. I found that very useful, Walter. Um, Great. Yeah, especially uh, the giving it back to reality, consciousness, whatever is is a step I haven't done before, and I really appreciate that part of it too. Good, yeah. good. Well, that's that's one of my great joys, both for myself, but in our group, where I see that where something that somebody says is is absolutely appropriate for somebody where they are, mm -hmm. and that kind of sharing, even though. I believe fundamentally that every path is unique. None of our paths are two paths are the same, but yeah. there are pieces where somebody else's path can inform yours and your exploration of your path. And I think that's just one of the great joys of, of what we do in terms of trying to share our understanding with people. Yes, Definitely. I totally agree. And I'm so grateful that, uh, that you shared yours and I'm so happy that we get to share it with our listeners. So thank you so much, Walter, for this is wonderful. It's just been my great, great pleasure, Brian and Jonathan. And I can, I so admire the work that you do and I'm uh, so supportive of it. And uh, just, uh, I think it's just wonderful. I wanna give a quick shout out to our Patreon supporters that you make this possible. So if you're interested in getting extra stuff from us, go to patreon.com forward slash awareness explorers. And uh, if people wanna connect with you, Walter, is there a way that they can do that? Yes, I'm on Meetup. Uh, and just look for Rupert Spira NYC, even though we're not really centered in New York City anymore, but that's an easy way to find it. Or if, again, there's there's only a couple things on Meetup with Rupert Spira and you can connect with, you can either message me through Meetup or you can attend our, we, we meet every Thursday and uh, have people from all over the world that join us. It's great to have groups like that. And is it on Zoom or in person? Uh, Zoom. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's it, a great service. It, it used to be in person. And, uh, you know, we would go and sit in Walter's comfortable living room and sit on the couch and hope that we don't fall asleep during the meditations. Um, but it was only New Yorkers there. And now it's so wonderful that we have people from Australia, India, all over the world joining us as well. Oh, yes. That's great. Any last words, Brian or Walter? Just enjoyed this tremendously. It's just been a yeah. great joy. Thank you so much for your invitation. It's always fun to explore with fellow explorers. And, uh, exactly, exactly. Till next time, to our listeners, keep exploring. Keep exploring. Thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers. To learn more, you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. We'd love it if you would post a review. And please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends. Because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.